All right, guys, welcome to this week's version of Beyond 22 Basketball. I am Terrence Oglesby. I also have my main man, Fax and Childress. He's fixing up some things in the back. But we have a bit of a different episode for you this week. Why? Well, COVID canceled two games. Or not canceled, but postponed two games against North Carolina last Saturday. Carolina's a little lucky about that. And then Syracuse on Tuesday. So where does that leave us? That leaves us scrambling for a little content. But we're going to be okay because decided to do something different. Like I said, after most games as a coach, you would scramble up some good and bad clips, some good things that you've done over the past, over the last game and some bad things that you did over the past over the last game. So I decided to do that after a couple of days, so or after uh, the first few games of the season, and then I'm going to break it down here on the screen. So that'll be that'll be different, but it'll be good. We'll also review Tuesday and Wednesday's ACC games. We're going to talk a little bit about each and every one. Do, of course, my main man Faxon's mid-major player of the week, so that should be good. And then, last but not least, I usually do the quick 10 preview. So I'm going to move that, since there was no games, I'm going to move that from an individual segment to this segment right here. We're going to end up at the end of this show. I'm going to break down film of Virginia and look, at, look for some things that uh, Clemson could do to be successful against the Cavaliers. Always well coached by Coach Tony Bennett and still have very good players, but a little bit better offensively this season as opposed to defensively like they have been in the past. So I think there's going to be some different things that Clemson's going to be able to attack where they haven't been able to do so in the past. But first of all, I want to say hello to my main man, Faxon. Faxon, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm excited to talk about some basketball. You know, the Tigers have taken a brief hiatus with the COVID scare uh, last week, but this week, hopefully the team is fully healthy and ready to take on Virginia. Yeah, and here's kind of my take on going forward. I'm going to talk probably a little bit more than Faxon today. He's very smart. He does a lot of good stuff, but I'm going to be selfish because I broke down a lot of film. So Faxon, I'm just going to have apologize that before that, before we get started. But a few things that Clemson has done really well. This pick and roll spacing and recognition. There have been times because you have a guy like Amir Sims, who has been fantastic all season. Faxon, to me, he's looking like he's going to be a first-team All-ACC performer if Clemson keeps performing in the manner in which they have. And yes, you got to think that with these uh, individual stats and accolades, how good your team is does matter when it goes into the voting. And if the Tigers can keep up their level of play right now, I think Amir Sims is the clear-cut is a clear-cut first-team All-ACC member. I mean, as of right now, Clemson is atop the ACC. They're in that one through three range, and Amir Sims is the best player on the team. So I think that Amir can definitely get there if he continues to have this numbers and if Clemson finishes as a top-five team in the ACC. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. And you bring up numbers. The numbers thing is a little bit curious because he's only averaging 12.7 points a game. I think that's good for 24th in just the conference. But his impact on his teammates, his impact on the flow of the offense, and the way he communicates on defense are obviously huge. But first, we're going to talk a little bit about pick and roll, spacing, and recognition. This is something that Clemson's done really well this year. Why? Because you have a guy who can both roll and finish at the basket and shoot threes like my main man, Amir. So I'm going to go ahead and let this roll. And I'm just going to let it. You look, Alex him away, solid rear view contest. And you're going to come up and you're going to run some different actions. And this is what makes him so dangerous. He can attack you in transition. He can do different things that way. But look. Here you're going to have a pick and roll situation. This was the dunk against NC State. And I'm going to explain to you why Amir had just as much to do with the dunk as Clyde did. But here, you have a semi-break situation. You don't get it. Amir pulls it back out. You have Alamir Dawes at the point guard position. Ball screen coming, and Amir's going to pop. Now here's an interesting situation. He pops up. Look at this little point. Did you see the little point, Faxon? Yeah. He points at Clyde. Why does he do that? He's trying to get him to space the floor. This is your help guy right here. Amir Sims' man has to help on a, on a ball screen situation. He flips back, and because he's motioned Clyde to get down, it creates a longer closeout. This is a veteran move. This is a senior player playing with a senior player and helping understand spacing and ways to attack the basket against a high-pressure team like the NC State Wolfpack. So you see, one more pass, good left-hand pass. And of course, Clyde dunks on the entire city of Raleigh. Yes. This is good offense, this is good ball movement, and just something as small as Amir Sims pushing Clyde down to the corner to where maybe Clyde's usually pretty good as far as picking his spots, but they give him an extra two or three feet to kind of 
be able to attack a closeout with a little bit more ferocity. And because the ball moved so quickly, NC State's help side was a half second late, resulting in a quiet dunk. Yes, and like you said, this is a senior. This is what you're expecting from a leader of the team. This is what you're expecting from a potential first team All ACC member. And Amir Sims is a winning player who makes winning plays, and this is just a prime example of one of those. Yeah. It's a winning play. So I felt like because most of the clips end up with Amir on the tape, that I needed to have one without him on. This is also good pick and roll recognition. Right here. P.J. Hall is going to set a ball screen coming back to the action. This allows Nick Honor, he has to raise up because Cam Hayes, in this, in this particular situation, Cam Hayes is going to have to come over and help on the roll guy. What happens? Because your angles are good, you're able to hit that back guy. Look at this seal. This could have easily gone in, but because he's sealing so high, P.J., who has done a lot of good things with his effort, and this is a good reason why, is able to seal Manny Bates, the best shot blocker in the league, by far, actually, is able to see, seal him up higher, creating the driving angle for Nick Honor. And he has been very good so far this season. This is a team that if they play with the correct spacing, if they play unselfishly, and if they get rid of the ball and pass on time and on target, they can score a lot of points, facts. And we've seen that because this is a team that's shooting the ball much better from three. They're moving the ball at a much higher rate. A little bit of it's because... Hey, they have more players that can do it, but for the most part, it's because their, their ability to identify where the help is coming from has really helped in pick and roll situations this season. Yes, and I think Clemson, while they may not score the most points in a lot of games, the team IQ in general is very high. I feel like Clemson generally does a good job of taking care of the ball, and these last couple games, Clemson's been getting better and better shots, and these games have been getting higher pace. But with that being said, the defense is still top of the country when you look at all the metrics. So um, if Clemson can keep that balance between offense and defense and be able to put up between the 60s and the 70s, there are not going to be a lot of teams that can beat Clemson. I mean, you look at Alabama and what they're doing right now, mm -hmm. that team scored 56 points on Clemson. And I think they have 70-plus in the rest of their games, and they're going to be ranked soon. So It went up in one in rup, which Kentucky's not great, but yep. they went up in one in rup by 20. Yeah. I mean, it was a fantastic Put up 85 on them. A very good team. And they're, they're, they're guarding, and they're able to make the right decisions. This is another thing. Transition offense for the Tigers, they're not quite as good as when Dan Dante Grantham ran the four. But they're still pretty good because Amir Sims can make things happen. Jonathan Bear can make things happen. On occasion, you'll see Omax take off with the ball. And when John Newman runs the four, you have a lot of different guys that can bring it up and create on a semi-break situation. But Sims in particular has been really good this season when he's been able to get a rebound and take off. Yes, and a lot of times that is uh, due to the fact that you know, the team does a really good job of spacing out on the break. I feel like there's, no, there's not really, uh, the lane isn't cluttered very often. So when Amir can go straight down the lane and transition, it's going to draw multiple people to him, and he's going to be able to kick it out for open buck. Because you see Nick Honor is the beneficiary of that. I would say the most mm -hmm. is Nick Honor will get the ball off of a catch in transition and just pull up for three, and he's got a very good percentage on I'm those. glad you brought that up. I'm glad you brought that up because I'm, that's not my first clip, but it's coming up. This is just another example. You're getting pressured by Florida State. You're able to hit a mirror. This is a dime pass for an easy dunk. These are things that not typical five men are able to do. And because he's playing the five, he gets some favorable matchup. Balsa Copravica in this one, you see him number five, trailing the play a little bit too slow. But if you're able to get a five man to handle the ball and distribute it in the manner in which Amir has done, you're able to get shots like this all night. Here's another example coming up. Tough shot, Anthony Polite, Amir takes off, and you're going to see him. Look at this ball handling in the front court. Now he's able to draw defenders. He gets rid of one. He is attracting the attention of three players right off the bat, and because he's so good at it, he creates so much more attention. Jonathan Bear, as far as rim running is concerned, is very gifted going from rim to rim with his speed, with his athleticism. And on this particular occasion, Amir is able to find him. He's able to use a ball fake and go straight up. Those two together are pretty special because Bear is so fast from end to end. And then the fact that they can both get a rebound and take off with it, it makes them very dynamic in the full court. Yes, and Bear is very good at the rim as well. And I would say that... While Bear does have his shortcomings, when Clemson gets out and runs, these are the games he thrives in. And while Clemson only did give up 56 points to Alabama, I think it was, 
that the, the pace was still played very high. That's how Alabama likes to play. The pace of that game was still running and moving, and Jonathan Bear won that game for Clemson at the end. And he had, I think, the last eight points of the game for the Tigers. So when he can get out in a situation where he's in transition, he's borderline unstoppable because he's, his touch is so good around the rim, mm -hmm. and he moves like a guard. Absolutely. You're, you're absolutely right. I, there's not one point that I can pick apart from that. But you were talking a little bit. This was a huge play when Clemson was playing NC State at home. As you can see, there's little less than 50 seconds to play. Clemson's down three points. And this is another, just, this is, a, this is an Amir Sims first team ballot hype video. So from now on, if anybody's thinking about it, just watch the first 15 or 20 minutes or whatever of this show. And you'll be able to see, hey man, he has a lot to do with the success of everybody around. So this is an interesting, obviously you don't want to settle if you're NC State. But as, as you see here, Nick Honor's calling for the ball, but Amir doesn't throw it to him. Why do you think that is? Because if he knows that if Nick Honor is able to get the ball early in this possession, they're going to pick him up. What does Amir do? He knows they're down three. He, he's aware of time and score. He takes off himself. He's able to handle the ball. He drags the defender in. This guy comes all the way in. I think that's Devin Daniels. Comes all the way in. No, that's not Devin Daniels. It doesn't matter. Comes all the way in, giving the five... 5-10, Nick Honor a chance to get an open three and tie the game. Nick Honor, obviously you've got to make a huge clutch shot, but at the same time, Amir Sims made that play, Faxon. Just going right into the teeth of the defense. I mean, you can see even on the clip, if you flash back over there, he's got four people in the general vicinity of him. Four people are around him, and he drew the entire defense in on the break, and just kicked right out for honor and eat the, the shot contest is late on Nick honor yeah so it, I mean here, here's kind of what you were talking about the whole defense collapses around him yeah and, and and I mean what a play drives directly at him to not give him a choice he's gonna have to pick him up or he's gonna give up a lay and on top of that if he's looking the other way look at Alex yes Alex is standing wide open yeah but he knows who he's giving that ball yeah to. It's he, good he, he knew Nick. the whole time Nick honor was gonna get that ball that's the reason he didn't kick it up these are just little things that you see Amir do that doesn't necessarily show up on the stat sheet. That shows up as an assist. But there's other times it's where... It's a lot more than that. It's a lot more than that. It's setting up your teammates. The, the push down from, to, to get Clyde in the corner so he can attack a harder closeout. That doesn't show up on the stat sheets. He doesn't get an assist for that because Clyde took two dribbles. So it's little things like that that signify his... What's the right word? That signify his importance to this team. Now, I have a couple of other things. Kind of the bad part. And I'm going to bring this up because, one, Virginia's coming up, and these are things that you can't do against Virginia. So, first and foremost, you cannot over-dribble. You, you can struggle to see spacing. You can't do that against Virginia, especially when you pass and you penetrate, and then you pass and you penetrate right away. I'm going to explain what I, talk about, what, what, what I mean right here. So Alamir Dawes is penetrating right into the teeth of the defense. This is three people. And this is an area where Virginia is very good. They are an overhelp team. Now, they are long and they are athletic in most of their positions except for point guard. But here, you cannot pass out and penetrate right back into the help. And as you see, you have a blocked shot. You have all this help right here. And Amir drives right back into it. This is not something you're going to be able to do against Virginia. You're still able to get a, a, a shot out of it. But this is not something that you're going to be able to do against Virginia. Alex Hemingway gets a shot. He's not able to hit it. Obviously, whenever there's an overhelp team, and NC State is not, is not necessarily that. They, they're somebody who's going to get out in the paint. They're not going to overhelp. They're not going to do those things. But you cannot penetrate, pass, and penetrate because the defense has already settled in. If you don't have a shot right away, you need to move it to a one more, especially to the corner, and maybe he can penetrate. But penetrate, penetrate typically doesn't work. I know that's a small thing that not a lot of middle school and high school teach, uh, coaches teach, but penetrate, pass, pass, penetrate. That's typically where you're going to be able to find some actions. Yes, and especially against a Virginia team, we know that they have not been great on defense this year for their standards, but a Tony Bennett Virginia team is one of the most dangerous defensive teams at all times, regardless of personnel, regardless of what they've done. If you make mistakes, they're going to prey on you. And when you add in that Jay Huff standing in the paint, I think he's got like two and a half blocks in his mm -hmm. last five games. He's just absolutely beasting right now. Clemson's got to make sure to move the ball and get as many quality looks as they can because if they don't, it's going to be a rough night for them. Yeah. 
And I have one more kind of quip. I, I feel like offensively Clemson's played well. They've moved the ball. They have a bunch of unselfish guys. They're moving it from side of the floor to side of the floor. But they have had times during this season where they've become a little bit passive. This part in particular, ball not touching the paint. And if it is touching the paint, you're not doing it in a manner to bring the defense in. And the worst game of all, to be honest with you, was the Virginia Tech game. And this is why they couldn't generate some more open looks for themselves. So... Here's a good example. Clemson was a little lethargic, but you see no dribble penetration around the, around the perimeter. He touches the paint. He is not in a scoring situation. I think this is a significant portion of the problem when the, when the Tigers went up to Blacksburg. He got it in. It wasn't in a situation. Look at the other defenders. They don't have to help. There's no reason for them to leave their man and thus creating difficult scoring opportunities. So if you do get it in, you need to figure something out. As you can see, the ball stays in the paint. You, you settle for a contested two. And if you're going to get the ball in the paint, it needs to be a dangerous paint touch. It needs to be, like you said, it needs to be you're not just going in there because you know you need to. It needs to be a scenario where you're, t you're getting the ball in the paint because you, you have a person down there who's either open or it's Amir Sims who can make a move or P.J. Hall who can make a move and they're in a position to make a move and score. You can't just throw well, it in there the and throw it back out. Yeah. Yes, you penetrate You're not doing score. anything except wasting time by chucking the ball in there just to chuck it right back out. Yeah, and you saw a little bit of that. Yeah, if you watched the Notre Dame-Virginia game, which I'm not sure a whole lot of people did because Virginia actually absolutely smacked them, but in the first five minutes of the game, Kihei Clark was penetrating into the lane but he wasn't going in there to score, so he wasn't drawing any help. And it kind of developed a little bit of a difficult start for Virginia, but they ended up blowing him out anyway, so that obviously broke down as the game went forward. But attacking the paint has been a concern when they've been struggling to score. As you see, Amir has been getting pushed out away from the paint. This is too far. If Amir gets it in 8 to 10 feet away, he's deadly. 14 to 15 feet, that's an extra dribble, and that's more people poking at the ball and trying to get in. And you settle for a tough one because you're not able to create the adequate amount of spacing to make things work properly. Here's another possession against Virginia Tech. The ball just continued. Against Virginia Tech, the ball just continued to move side to side. You got John Newman, he's trying to get down left-handed. You have all your help down there, not able to get into the paint. And now you're going to try to just move it from side to side. Spacing is bad. Not able to get anywhere. And what happens? You end up settling. You have to find ways against Virginia Tech, against Virginia, these overhelp teams, to get into the paint. And it's not as easy as it sounds. You can't just get in there. I mean, there's some good defensive teams. You've got to set up some things to where you get guys going downhill into the paint, not only just to score but to create for others, but you have to go in there with the mindset to score back. So. And I'm assuming just based off the fact that Clemson has, they've known that they've had a week off now uh, to get prepared for Virginia. I'm assuming to see some sets early in this game from Brad um, that have the central focus on getting the Tigers into the paint, and I would hope to see that from Tigers early. Um, and I think this upcoming segment is going to be about Jay Huff, and Jay Huff is a big reason about uh, why Virginia has been so successful as of late and why they've uh, been able to get things turned around. Yeah, in the last few games, Jay Huff has been incredible pretty much the entirety of, I mean, since ACC conference play started. He's been able, and he doesn't shoot anywhere but from the top of the key. And we're going to talk a little bit about more about Virginia's offensive game as we get, for, as we, uh, get going forward. But first, we have... The underrated man of the week. So I'm going to let you fax and go, get on up here. I'm going, go, I'm going to let you talk a little bit about your guy, Max Abram, uh, Abmus from Oral Roberts. Uh, yes, the underrated man of the week from mid-major school this week is Max Abmus, and he goes to Oral Roberts. 6'1", 185 pounds. As you can see from the stats, he's absolutely lighting it up this year. He's getting 21 a night, um, and this is the key stat that, to point out for me. 45% from three on eight three-pointers a game. So if you think this is a fluke or something, it's not. This kid shot it well from three last year, and he's shooting it well again this year. Not only that, he plays for a guy, Paul Mills, who came from Baylor with Scott Drew, so he's obviously going to have to defend. And is this a team you see can win the Summit League this year? Um, I think that personally that Oral Roberts can win the Summit League this year. They're currently in, uh, in competition with South Dakota and North Dakota State. 
In my opinion, Oral Roberts is the best team in the conference. They've, uh, they went to Wichita State on the road and uh, Oklahoma State on the road and competed in both of those games. I think this is going to be a tournament team. And if Max keeps up what he's been doing so far this year, he will be a very exciting player to watch and maybe a 3-14 matchup come March. And not to mention 21.3 points a game, four assists a game, and he's had 42 assists only 19 turnovers so he's a little bit of a jack of all trades he really gets it done yes he can definitely protect the ball and I think that you would see that he is a very gifted passer more than the four assists would show with the turnover numbers and also if he didn't have to carry the offensive load for a team I think you would see more of what he can do passing the ball but for this team it's really him and one other guy they're carrying the whole load and Max has got to shoot a lot for them to be successful as you see he's shooting eight threes a game I think close to 14 field goal attempts so he's really carrying the offensive load for the team all around. If you're shooting 45 percent from three you can go ahead and get that number up around 12 or 13 as far as I'm concerned. He, that, that, I mean that's pretty good. Uh, Coach Paul Mills he has to be absolutely thrilled with the way that uh, Max has been this year. Man I love your mid-major dudes of the week. Under, underrated man of the week. We Got to give no, them some love. We had Furman last week with Noah Gurley. Yep. I was supposed to call that game, and then all of a sudden it was canceled because of COVID. Yeah. Those kind of things happen. So it's been a uh, it, uh, good job. This is a, this is a very good player as well. It's just another it's another um, guy to keep an eye keep on. Keep your eye on as yeah. we keep going. So thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Appreciate you. All right. So, not only that, we're going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to move this chair here, we're going to talk a little bit about last week's, last week's games uh, in conference. Uh, Clemson obviously didn't play, but these guys did, and there were some interesting predicaments uh, throughout, the entire, throughout the entire weekend. First of all, starting at Blacksburg with... Uh, Duke and Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech obviously staying on on fire for the most point. They haven't really stopped. They, they ran Duke in circles all game. Yes, and specifically in the first half is when I would say Virginia Tech was the strongest in this game. Um, VT, I think, I want to say had 40 plus points in the first half of this game. And Duke just really has to struggle defensively for the majority of the season. And those struggles were on full display in the first half of this game. Um, I cannot buy into Duke. I've said it a million times on the show. I know you've said it a million times on this show that um, I cannot buy into Duke uh, because of their defensive struggles and just generally what, is show, uh, what they've shown so far this season. Yeah, I, I think Matthew Hurt, as good as he has been for the most part, in the game he had 20 points, 11 rebounds, and a steal. I'm pretty sure that steal must have been a result of something else. He hasn't really guarded anybody all year. People are talking about him potentially being a first-team All-ACC. If you're scoring 19 points a game and you're giving up 24 points a game, I have a hard time believing that you're the most valuable part of your team. Duke's kind of a weird case for me. And it's because, one, Jason Johnson hasn't been back. You're going to have to see how they do moving forward whenever he's returned and he's healthy. But I'm still confused as to what their direction is. You're playing through Matthew Hurt, but he's not making anybody better. I'm curious to see is when Jalen Johnson comes back, can they run some offenses through him because he's better as a rim attack guy off the dribble, and he's better at finding his teammates in open spaces in order to get for threes. Maybe DJ Stewart doesn't have to work as hard. You have uh, Joey Baker, who's an excellent shooter, but can't necessarily create for himself. Who's going to be that guy that can create for other people for the Duke Blue Devils? Yeah, and I think the simple answer is it, it's either Jalen Johnson or Bust because I don't know if anyone – else on the roster is capable of it. Jordan Goldwire, fantastic player. I would say more of a role player. He's going to spot up. One of the best defenders in the ACC, don't get me mm -hmm. wrong. This guy isn't going to create open shots for himself and other people. And Stewart's been kind of a disappointing uh, disappointment so far in the playmaking factor. I think his assists and turnover numbers are pretty close, which is not what you want to see out of your starting guard. Can Jalen Johnson, when he's back fully healthy, he did play in this game. Um, he didn't play a ton of minutes, and he didn't really look like he was full uh, 100%. Mm -hmm. But when he's fully healthy and Duke gets into the trenches of their ACC schedule, can Jalen Johnson carry this team and make th these other players better? Because right now, as you said, Hurts got the box score stats, and if you're not watching the games, you might think, well, this guy's killing it this year. Mm -hmm. On defense and as far as creating for others, it's not, it's not been up the bar. It's non-existent. But look, I, I feel like we're talking too much about Duke and not enough about Virginia Tech. How good have they been? My man Tyree. Reese Radford, who I don't know if he shot a three all season. He's six two, and he's been playing the four for the majority of the majority of games played. He's been fantastic for Coach Mike Young. 
and relentless attacking the basket. 18 points, 12 boards, 5 assists, done a lot of everything, and he fits perfectly along with their other guys. Hunter Couture is a shooter. Uh, Jalen Cohn's a shooter. They have several others on that squad that can really space out the floor. Not to mention, my ACC Player of the Year so far is Kibe Aluma. Really? Yeah, I, I don't. I think for the most part there hasn't been anybody impact their team as much as Aluma has this year. And you can see the difference between this season and last, how confident Virginia Tech is to get the ball in the paint and basically score at will or at least get a good shot attempt out of it. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I think Mike Young is doing a fantastic job. I think the big three of Cone, Radford, and Aluma really uh, – it gives a bunch of different looks where they can attack you from if one of the guys isn't getting going. Because Cone can shoot you out of the gym from the perimeter, and then you got Radford and, and uh, him inside. And Virginia Tech can really just attack you from all facets. They've got good role players to complement their star skill set, and they have a fantastic coach. And, I mean, they only gave up 67 points in this game. They gave up 62 to Clemson. They appear to be locked in on the defensive end as well, so I've seen some good things from them on both sides. And I don't see, we said this last year, but this year, I don't see why they can't finish top four in this conference. Yeah, I, I don't say. I think the two traditionally football schools, Clemson and Virginia Tech, both are going to end up with top four seeds in this conference. It's kind of an upside down year, but I've said it before, I'll say it again. The summer without having your guys on campus has significantly hurt the Dukes, the Carolinas, especially Kentucky, all these one and done schools. They need that time to develop their culture and how they want guys to perform. Boston College in Miami. It hurts my heart. I don't know what's going on with Miami. Obviously, Chris Likes is hurt. Obviously, Cam McGusty is hurt. But even so, they are still talented than this Boston College team. I'm happy Boston College got going. Faxon texted me with their three-point numbers. I can't remember exactly what they were. But you have to shoot the ball well against this Miami team because they do tend to overhelp defensively under Coach Jim Laranega. Yeah, I think that Boston College made 19 threes on more than 40% in this game. And when you shoot like that, you're not going to lose unless you're just completely giving up a, a, point, uh, a layup on every possession. This was a, a breakout game of sorts for BC. We're going to see if they can keep this uh, momentum steamrolling. And Miami is in desperate need of Chris Likes more than ever. Uh, they're 1-5 in, in conference, and obviously that's just not good enough for what we thought that Miami was going to be coming into the year. Injuries are a terrible thing, especially when the injury happens to arguably your best player and playmaker in Chris Likes. But Boston College, it's a team that can shoot. They have guards that can explode. Jay Heath, I've kind of been singing his praises all year, and he hasn't lived up to the hype. But 25 points, 7 boards, and 4 assists, that's doing a little bit of everything. Moving on to Carolina, and I want to address this because I got in plenty of arguments over the course of the past four days about Carolina and Syracuse. And, Car and Carolina fans, they come out of the woodworks, they're like, oh, we're back, we're back. Hold your horses. Nobody is going to turn the ball over against Syracuse. If they're sitting back in the 2-3 zone, that's not what they do. They want to outsize you, they want to bother shots, and they want to make it very difficult for you to knock down long-range uh, threes. It wasn't because Carolina's gotten better. Those guards are still struggling. Caleb Love is still struggling. They did beat a, I would call it a mediocre win at home at Chapel Hill against a Syracuse team that hasn't quite figured it out as of yet. Yeah, and the biggest problem with this team is Caleb Love. And this guy's a five-star recruit, expected to come in and be the next big thing. I mean, we both thought he was going to have a fantastic year. I think he's shooting sub-30% from the field on the year mm -hmm. and sub-15% from three on the year. This guy can just not get it figured out. He's turning the ball over every other possession, it seems. Garrison Brooks, I think he had a pretty good game in this game, but has not been who he was last year, this year so far. So I really wish that Clemson played these guys on Saturday. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, I think yeah. Clemson would have won this game. I, I don't think there's any question just because Clemson would have been able to force their young guards into so many turnovers. These guys right here, Wake Forest. I want to address them before I get to Louisville because everybody knows Louisville's really good. But Wake Forest, the manner in which they're playing under Coach Steve Forbes is really impressive. They're filled to the brim with transfers. And I'm not talking like top-notch transfers. Johnson from uh, University of Tennessee, eighth, ninth guy. Uh, Isaiah Wilkins from Virginia Tech, seventh, eighth, ninth guy. Davian Williamson from ETSU, very good player, but not necessarily a huge contributor. He is getting these guys to play really well together. They're moving the basketball, and they, ha they hung in with a Louisville team that, despite losing their starting point guard in Carter Witt, were still able to move the ball and get some good things going. I like the direction of this Wake Forest team, but Louisville and Carleek Jones, those are some bad boys. 
Yeah, and I would agree with you from the perspective of I've been impressed with Wake's last two performances against Duke and Louisville. Um, both of these games have been losses, but I feel like they've played well in both games, and it's just one of those things where you can tell they're well coached, the guys are playing hard, they just don't have the talent. And there's nothing wrong with that because if Steve Forbes can continue what he's doing with his coaching philosophy and getting these guys to buy in, then the results will come and the recruits will come and Wake Forest can get turned around as a program because in these last couple of years they've just been in purgatory and they've had zero bright side. Yeah, it's been hard. And, and the crazy part about it is they have a, probably a third of the talent, but they're playing harder and better. You can see where the culture is kind of beginning to change with Coach Forbes. He's an excellent coach. It's, gonna, it's not going to take long. They have to kind of get their guys in. But Louisville, Carlick Jones, they're playing without Charles Menland, transfer from San Francisco. They're playing out without Malik William. They're starting five man for the past three years. They are a problem. You want to talk about the top three teams in conference? It's Clemson, Lu Virginia Tech, and Louisville. Clemson, Virginia Tech, and I would say Louisville's right there at the top right now because they have scores all over the yard. Carlick Jones is impressive, and David Johnson is as good as we thought he was going to be. And this is just more of a testament to Chris Mack as well. Probably, I'm going to say one of the best coaches in the conference, if not the best coach in the conference. What he does year in and year out, he just never disappoints. And, you know, there were some speculations about them coming into this year because they didn't have a ton of returning play. I don't think they had a returning player averaging more than seven points per game. Obviously, you're bringing in Carleek and some other transfers, but they were a giant question mark coming into the year as far as how many points is Carly Jones going to be able to average and can these other guys step up and produce to score the basketball? And Chris Mack. They score. They score 70 plus points every mm -hmm. game. They've got quality wins already, and this team is just could not be any more impressive. JJ Trainer, freshman from Kentucky, has been phenomenal, standing about 6'10, long arms, skinny, can shoot it a little bit from the outside. Jalen Withers has come in after redshirting a season ago. He's been very good, and not to mention Josh Nickelberry has been a very good role player for the Cardinals so far. This Louisville team could be a problem moving forward, especially when they get William and they get. Um, Excuse me, especially once they get William and they get Menland back, they are going to be a force to be reckoned with. Virginia, Notre Dame. Notre Dame had a pretty good plan lined up into this game. Virginia, they weren't overhelping on their penetrations. They were staying out on shooters, and then just the lid fell off. And then Jay Huff started getting rolling. Notre Dame wasn't hitting shots. They started out the game 0 for 11 from 3. And Notre Dame, shooting 38% from 3 coming into the game, were actually the top shooting. ACC team from three-point land and I don't know what it was they were still getting open shots just not able to knock them in fax them yeah and you know I did not catch a ton of this game I caught uh, some of the end of this game I think this is just Virginia has more talent and they're they're better coached and Notre Dame did have a good game plan coming into this game. Obviously, Virginia got straight early on. As we were talking about earlier in the show, how Kihei Clark was kind of getting into the paint and he didn't have anything to do with it, and he would just pass it back out, and they were passing the ball around and could not get an open shot to save their lives. And the game just broke open in the second half for, uh, for the Cavaliers. I'm hoping that they cannot replicate this performance on Saturday, and I'm hoping they, <laughs> uh, they look like first-half Virginia on Saturday against the Tigers. Well, what worried me more than anything was, one, Jay Huff played extremely well. Sam Hauser was, typically Sam, was typical Sam Hauser. But the one that scared me the most was Casey Morcel, averaging 5.9 points a game, per game on the year, but got really hot, started out the game 5 of 5. I hope that's not the game that he can kind of get rolling and start into something. But Casey Morcel, sophomore, Washington, D.C., St. John's College, a very good player. He's just had a hard time gaining his footing. But the most disappointing team for me right now has got to be the Wolfpack. Dude, I don't know what they were doing. I don't know what they were doing. I looked at the halftime score. I'm like, they have 60 at half. And then I look at the final score. I'm like, they put up 105 in a college game? Hmm. I, I didn't even know how to react. Well, I, one of the big things is NC State loves to rely on their pressure defense. Well, if Manny Bates isn't back there behind them, it's going to create some problems because Florida State, as big and athletic as they are, they're going to be able to finish there. Valsa Kopravica had his way. Scotty Barnes was able to get whatever he wanted. And to be honest with you, NC State for the first half didn't play very hard. Yeah, and, you know, after seeing NC State play so hard, and I felt like they played a really good game against Clemson, specifically Thunder, Burke, and Daniels, this was just kind of a weird bounce-back performance. And it was a weird thing to see Clemson go – I mean, Clemson beat Florida State, and then Clemson struggled with NC State and had to come back and win, and then Florida State just blows NC State off the face of the earth. 
It's just a weird dynamic. It's the ACC this year. Everything doesn't make sense. It, it, nothing makes sense as of right now. But Raquan Evans, who's been very good for the Seminoles so far, 24 points, six boards, two assists. But the ACC is still wide open. It, it's such a weird season in that the top is thin, the middle is huge, and then like the bottom four teams, it just drops off a cliff because Boston College isn't great. Wake Forest, they're getting there, like I said, but they're still not great and able to compete. But the top 10, 11 teams, they can beat anybody on any given night, and it sometimes could result in a score like this right here. It's a strange season. Obviously, there's different drawbacks that are occurring, but for the most part, it's competitive every single night. Guard play isn't typically as good this season as it has been in the past. I think Big Ten's got much better guards overall than, than the ACC conference. But all in all, an interesting Tuesday, Wednesday. But moving forward, we got the UVA scout. I decided to do this this week simply because, one, we don't have a whole lot to talk about. There was no game. We, we, so I've been doing these scouting reports from home. Decided today might be a little bit better to take it here in the studio, have a little bit bigger TV, and we can explain it a little bit further. Faxon, what are some of the keys to the game that you think would be important for Clemson? Um, important for Clemson, slowing down Jay Huff will be number one because he's on an absolute tear right now. And I, I say that I think that Hauser can get his and Kagi can get his. You can't have a role player go off like they did in the last game, like we were referencing against uh, Notre Dame. So keep Huff uh, production to a minimum and don't let a role player go for 20 on you. Yeah, right. That's a good point. But Huff has been excellent, obviously. Seven foot one, 240 pounds. One of the only players in the country to shoot better than 40%. Actually, the only player in the country to shoot better than 40% from three and have at least 25 blocks on the season. This man right here can really coach him up. It's Coach Clay Thompson of Washington State. He moved over. It kind of took him a little bit of time to get going. But he's got these guys in good shape. Even though we're talking about them being down a little bit, 8-2 and two and 4-0 and oh in conference isn't terrible. But... Starting off with this guy. This is the head of the snake, Kihei Clark, but this is the guy you got to worry about mostly when it comes to half-court offense because he's going to be the guy that can create for himself. They like to set him up a lot in the mid-post, and they like to let him shoot over the top of guys because he has a good size. He has good size at about 6'8", 215 pounds, and he has a really good shooting stroke, but he's been good, especially on the offensive land. Virginia's different this year because defensively, he's not as good as Braxton Key. And defensively, he's blocking shots, but he's not as good as Diakite. This is a team that has been exposed a little bit. Even though they beat Notre Dame pretty handily, they still gave up 68 points, which is not, as you know, very typical of a Virginia Cavalier team. Yeah, and the Virginia brand is defense, defense, defense. And you look at their game log this year, and the majority of their games are being played in the 60s and 70s, which is unorthodox for a Tony Bennett coach team. But like you said, they don't have the personnel this year to be a defensive identity team. They have to score points, to win, and they have to push the pace because their best two players are more offensive-minded than defensive in Hauser and Huff. So, and, I mean, Gonzaga put up 100 points on a Virginia yeah. team. That's unheard of. Yeah, but oh, hold on. That, uh, Gonzaga's the best team in the country. Yeah, but, and, and not only that, like, I, I went back and watched that game, especially after you said that last week. I... I went back and watched that game, and there's really nothing you could take from it because they were hitting shots early in the clock. They were hitting some kind of crazy attempts. So I'm not sure you can really take a ton away from that. But there are things that you could take away from, like, a Notre Dame, per se. But I'll get to that. Kihei Clark, this is the, quote-unquote, the head of the snake. Somebody, he's not going to over do it as far as trying to get his own shot. I think that's fairly obvious for everybody who's watched him. It feels like he's been there forever. But... 11 points per game, only 16 threes attempted on the season. That tells you a lot right there because a lot of teams are starting to back up off of him. He doesn't shoot great percentages, but he works best whenever he is creating for others and pestering opposing point guards. This guy right here, I want everybody to just go ahead and jump on the bandwagon right now. Reese Beekman, not phenomenal numbers. Not phenomenal numbers, but top 25 player in the country coming out of Louisiana. One of the quickest first steps, I would say, in college basketball a below average shooter as of right now, but somebody you're going to have to, wa you're going to, have to watch uh, as his career in Charlottesville progresses. They have one more guy who's equally dangerous and he's shooting close to 50%. Troy, May Troy Murphy III got eligible after they had that transfer passing to where everybody's currently eligible, but Rice transfer shooting over 49.8% from three, 
he is deadly. You're going to have to make him put it on the floor, and you cannot lose him, especially in all these screening actions that Virginia likes to run. Keys to the game, and I'm just going to go ahead and cut straight to film, but keys to the game. You cannot let Jay Huff get going. He loves to get this top of the, top of the key three. It's pretty much the only place he shoots it from, Faxon. Yeah, and Huff is shooting a ridiculous percentage from three, as we referenced earlier. Over 40% as a seven-footer is just unheard of, and Amir Sims has got his work cut out for him. Mm -hmm. That's and, he's, he's not, and he can't give him any space, yeah. which also limits your ability to help To play help teammates. defense. Yes, yes. And exactly we're going to need a big right. game from Jonathan Bear on help side because he's going to be the one playing down low. And guys like that, you're going to have to step up help side defense. Here. You're going to have to come over and block some shots or else they're going to be able to get into the paint because you do have to respect Huff so high out. Yep. Here's an example right here going into the game. This is the first play of the game. He's had 18 points. He had eight, 18 points and nine rebounds against Notre Dame. If he's able to get going, you see him setting ball screens, and they're going to have a little bit of a role replace. This is where Notre Dame was actually doing pretty good to start the game, as I referenced earlier. Look at the help side defense. Even when Kihei Clark drives all the way down, everybody else stayed put. That's what a little bit of what you're going to have to do. Make Clark a scorer when he gets down there. Can he do it? Absolutely. Is he going to do it a lot? No, sir. But a lot of these guys, Dan Goodwin stays. Uh, Lajewski stays. Carmody stays out, and you're having to create different situations. But this is going to be a little bit of a roll and replace. You have a back screen. Durham wants to help on the back screen. This is going to be something where the backside is going to have to help all the way over. You're going to have to be active on help side. Force them to make skip passes, and then you're going to be fast enough to close out, especially with this year's team. So Durham helps out. You cannot close out on him with low hands. This is a team, they ended up scoring above 80 points, but I'm telling you, the game before, they were only 61, and he had 18 both games. Without him getting going with only Sam Hauser and maybe, maybe Troy Murphy, uh, this is a team that you're going to be able to outscore because they're not defending as well. You got to get a hand up on him. I don't. Know, I don't even know what <laughs> yes, that guy was do. doing at the beginning. You got to. You got to know. Scouting report. This guy's shooting 40 percent. He's shooting like four or five threes a game, and Amir's got to be able to get up on that. Like you said, the backside. That's probably going to be Jonathan Bear, maybe John Newman, yeah. Hunter Tyson, depending on his status. Probably be a three. Probably a guard because they like yeah. to have Sam Hauser at the low, and then they like to interchange him a little bit. Sam yeah. Hauser does a lot of his damage from the 15, from about 15 feet. Here's another possession. He runs all of his stuff. Expect these early ball screens. You have a roll replace, swing, and then all they're doing is setting a down screen. You have to know that is his spot going in. Anytime he gets up to that top thing, Notre Dame hasn't been guarding, and they, apparently they didn't do their scouting report. You have to get a hand up on Jay Huff, who has been fantastic, shooting literally just from that spot. Know who you're guarding. Know where you, KYP, know your personnel. KYP game all day tomorrow because they're not going to be overly diverse in what they're running. A lot of role replace because they've got shooters. They're not running that wheel action that they've become so, that blocker mover scheme that they've become so famous for using. This is a game where you cannot let that third score or second score get going and you're going to be able to outscore this team. Here's another down screen, comes across. You have a roll, you have a replace. The replace is going to be Jay Huff. Obviously not good enough defense. They would call the late switch. Durham, you cannot, he's, he's a shot blocker. He's expecting to stay in the paint. You cannot do that against this team. You have to be ready to flare out to defend threes. As evidence, Jay Huff wide open. Forget it. Just another one. It's that simple. You cannot let that guy get going. He is the, Sam Hauser, he's been so consistent all year, Faxon. I don't know that he's somebody you're really going to be able to mitigate that much. Hauser's going to get his 15 regardless. Exactly That's what right. he does. But if you, can, if you can slow down Huff, then you, we have a really good chance to win. Yeah, if you can slow down Huff, if you can slow down Murphy, you're going to have a good chance to put yourself in good position to win at the end of the game because, one, they're not defending. And, two, it's just going to, it's, it, they, they're not going to be able to score enough. Without two, one of their three guys are not going to be able to score enough. This is another big one. Stay disciplined for the entire clock. Whenever you're guarding Hauser in the post, this is not an individual's film session, but whenever you guard Hauser in the post, you can't go for ball fakes. You have to stay on your feet. You have to put your chest on him, hands up, because they're going to run you into the ground with their offense. They're not going to be overly enthusiastic to get shots in the first 15 seconds. You have to maintain your discipline. You have to maintain your poise, and you can't get too eager to block shots. 
So these are going to be a little bit longer clips as we get going here. As you see, Hauser, phenomenal numbers the entire season. We have a ball screen from Kafaro who's seeing limited minutes right here, number 22. But you have to guard the entire possession. Maintain your distance. Maintain your contact. This was an excellent defensive possession by Notre Dame for the most part. But it comes to a point where you're going to have to contest and maintain your discipline. Durham, as good a shot blocker as he is, he really struggled this game defending multiple guys, Huff and Hauser in particular, because he wanted to block everything and he wanted to stay in the paint. They, they messed with him all night with the inside-outside action. Whenever he was inside, they ball faked him to death. When he was outside, he was trying to stay in too close. He really was struggling against Virginia's offense. And just looking down the road, whenever Clemson plays Notre Dame, based off of what I've seen in these very few clips and what you're talking about, Amir Sims is going to eat him alive. <laughs> like, seriously. I think yeah. Amir Sims can beat him off the dribble to the basket, and uh, he's going to be able to pull him out to the three-point line. So I'm enthused as a Clemson fan to play this team, not as much Virginia. Um, stop I, like how I, like, I like our chances versus Virginia because we will stay disciplined. That, that, that clip wasn't so much to beat up on uh, Juwan Durham. It was more so to show you that even though you guarded them really well, well, they made a tough shot for the entire duration of the clock. Well, it wasn't so much a tough shot. He created an easy shot at the end because you got undisciplined, right? Yeah. So that's one of the big portions of playing this Virginia team. Here is another possession. As I said, they're just going to continue to run their offense. They're doing back screen, roll over places. They're going to try to post up Hauser. This is where they love to get him. This is a scouting report area for Hauser. He's going to try to go right, get to the middle and he's going to ball fake you to death. It's the same move, but he's extremely patient, and he plays with good rhythm and pace. So what does that mean? You have to keep your, you have to stay in a stance. When he elevates, sometimes you're going to have to lose, and you're going to give up some good shots over top of you, but you definitely don't want to foul, and you don't want to make things easier on him. So here he is, ball fake, Durham again. He struggled all night. We can't have a guy like that struggle as much as what he did. You're going to have to hit threes over the top. Switching to offense now. You're going, to have to, you're going to have to hit some threes over the top when it comes to playing Virginia. Why? Because a little bit like Miami, except a lot better, they're an overhelp team. They're going to bring guys to the ball. They're going to play you extremely physical. So what's going to happen? You're going to be able to penetrate, bring guys towards you, and then kick out to the wings for open threes. Notre Dame got quite a few, but they weren't able to hit them. It was a tough, it was a tough game all around for the Irish because, one, they weren't shooting. Obviously, they weren't defending at a high level. But you're also going to have to hit some of these open threes. Here's Notre Dame. You're going to see this is great man-to-man -man defense. They are going to guard. They are going to trap the post when Amir gets in, which could present some problems because Amir, quite frankly, is going to be smaller than both Hauser and Huff. But he's been known to be a great passer out of the post. So what's going to happen? You're going to be able to get quick swings out and around the perimeter. You're going to have to start, be ready to catch and shoot, penetrate. And Durham, as much as I've been on him during this scouting session, he played really well offensively. Yep. Just not good enough offensively to put 80 points up against a good defensive team in Virginia. Yes, and if Clemson can knock down, I think the magic number will be, if Clemson can get to 10 three-pointers made in this game, I think they have a really good chance to win. And I don't know what currently, I think they make around eight or nine per game, mm -hmm. maybe a little more than that. Um, I would say Nick Honor is going to have a chance to get a lot of these catch-and-shoot threes because he does a really good job of, we saw there, moving off the ball, off of penetration. Nick Honor is very good at giving the ball up and then relocating to a spot for an mm -hmm. open shot. So really it just depends on, Amir Sims' uh, passing ability out of the post, which we've seen has been great so far this year. And if Amir can get, get the ball out quick when he gets doubled and not put the ball on the floor, Clemson should be able to swing the ball around and uh, create some open shots. Yeah, and, and what you said right there is very important, the movement without the ball. So you see right here, the pass out. Juwan Durham does a nice job. That ball starts driving towards him. He backs out because the help is going to come up. You have to move without the ball. You have to relocate to certain spots and be able to knock that shot down. As you see, number 11, Durham, right there to the corner, able to knock it down. Is it contested? Sure, but you're still going to have to hit some shots over the top. Here's another possession here in the second half. As you can see, it's kind of gotten out of sorts. But this is another opportunity that you're going to be able to get. As you see here, as you see here, they are going to overhelp. This is Nate Lejewski. 
That's Troy Murphy. They're going to come over and help a lot. There's going to be times where you can get downhill and make this skip pass. You have to be ready to shoot to relocate. Good job by Lejevsky, my breakout player. Uh, I think it's going to end up being most improved player of the season, quite frankly. But he's able to relocate spots and then knock down threes. This is going to be a huge part of what Clemson needs to do against Virginia on Saturday. And that was it. So, I'm going to go ahead and hit play here. There's your team. This is going to be an interesting game. It's going to be a defensive game. Clemson can win this game in the 50s. I think Clemson could also win this game in the high 60s and 70s. But they're going to have to limit Huff. They're going to have to do some different things schematically on defense. You're going to have, you can't help off of Huff because they do have good floor spacing. Yeah, and uh, okay, so just personal question. What would be your score prediction if you had to just on the spot for Clemson versus Virginia? I think mid-60s is what it's going to end up being. I think you think Clemson brings home the win? The way they've been playing and the way they've been defending, sure. I think Jonathan Bear is a weird matchup for Jay Huff, to be honest with you. I think, it, I think Jonathan Bear can get out there. He's so athletic that he can guard. The only thing is, is Jay Huff has killed us every year he's gotten significant minutes because he is a good shooter, and he's actually okay going to his right hand and finishing around the rim. Yeah. So what do you think? I think it's going to be a close game. I really view it as a coin toss. I think uh, the, the line in Vegas is not out yet, but I think that they would coincide with me. I think it's going to be two point, three point spread either way. Um, I think that Clemson is playing better basketball right now, especially, and they've got the momentum behind their side. So the fact that it's a home game, I think, is huge. So I'll take the Tigers in a very close game, okay. very close. I think it's going to go down to the wire like NC State did. Yeah, I think, I, I think you're absolutely right. We do have some questions this week because I asked a couple of days before. So I'm going to let you go ahead and start that one out. Yes, and we have some additional questions on top of that. Okay, nice. first question from Dave is, will Honor and Dawes be able to handle Kehi Clark and what is to look for offensively from Virginia? I think what you hope to do, I, we talked a little bit about what to expect offensively. They're going to run their offense uh, and run it, run it, run it until the end of the shot clock. You're going to have to stay disciplined. But what I am excited to see is if Dawes and Honor can wear down Clark because he hasn't been worn down all season and he hasn't been the entire time. He's kind of been like, uh, what, what's the right word? He's been the energizer bunny. He's never gotten tired during his entire stint in Charlottesville. I think that is something that the guards for Clemson can do this season. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, you know, Clark is a very annoying player to play against because we talk about Amir Sims being a winning player. I would, dis I would define him as a winning player that does a bunch of the little things correct. And one of those is just being available to play 30, 35 minutes a game. Mm -hmm. um, another question from Connor Edwards. Obviously, the defensive system is important for Virginia, but are they missing some individual pieces to make this, the system work like it has in previous years? Yeah. But they're missing Braxton Key and uh, Mamadi Diakite, but unfortunately you can't have both. So you get Sam Hauser, who is extremely effective on the offensive end, but is still a decent defensive player, but not necessarily that stalwart that he's Braxton just not Key, key or, He's not Key or Diakite. He no, just he's can't not. match that production on he's defense. Not. Well, but they're not him on offense. Yeah. So it's like you give up one for the other. Virginia's identity has always been defense. And that's why this year is so hard to gauge them. And I think we have different views on them, too, because – they were the preseason favorite to win the conference, ever, and Hauser was the preseason favorite to win player of the year because I think everyone thought that they were going to be able to make up for that slack defensively just because of the name brand and who they were. And this year, is just, it's not Virginia basketball. It's, it's a really weird dynamic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's not the same. They are doing many different things uh, offensively as well, quite frankly. They're posting up Clark. They're posting up a lot of their players in that 14 to 15-foot range which is not something they've done typically in the past. We've got a question from Doughboy in VA, and he okay. says, he says, what why, was the name? Doughboy in VA. Doughboy in VA. And he says, why is UVA visibly struggling with the pack line defense, and they look uh, out of sync on defense? Well, I, Key and Diakite are one, but another thing just to kind of come, uh, expound on that, they're not guarding the ball as well. And whenever Forrest have been able to attack Hauser, it's become a problem because they're having to overhelp. As you saw in the pick and roll situation where uh, Trey Wirtz of Notre Dame is able to make that skip pass to Lejewski because they're having to overhelp a little bit. The initial defense, that first line of defense, hasn't been as good as it's what it's been in the past. We have a question from Mark, and he says, 
Do you expect Clemson to try and push the pace against UVA like they did in the second half against FSU? And are you a better, a better three-point shooter than Virginia uh, legend Kyle Guy? That's a, that's a tough question, the second part. But the first part, I don't, I don't know. I, I think they're going to try to ex extend their defense out, and I think they're going to try to wear them down and maybe look for early opportunities. Looking at the Notre Dame game, uh, last game, they got open shots when they, they were able to pull, the, the, when they were able to push in the semi break. Dane Goodwin had some open looks. Uh, Robbie Carmody had some open looks. They just weren't able to knock them down. But they were up in the first 10 seconds of the shot clock. The problem with that is, is say you miss that shot, you have to go back and guard for another yeah. 30 seconds. And I think a lot of coaches get really worried about that portion of the game. Sometimes you have to take what's given because when you get in the half court against Virginia, they make it really difficult to get open shots. If you're able to, you, you need to be able to take what they give you, even if it is early. Which, to be honest with you, Faxon, if you look back at UMBC when they beat them a couple years ago, they were playing with their pants on fire. They were yeah. shooting it early in the clock. They weren't. They, they didn't weren't, care. They didn't care. They were playing loose. That's how you beat Virginia. You play loose, you take your open shots, you make your open shots. Um, we have a question from Jim, and he says, will the long layoff between games impact Clemson, and what was the longest layoff you ever went at Clemson between regular season games? I want to say a week maybe was the longest layoff I had. But I, I, I talked a little bit to William Quackenbush today about this, and Clemson has had in the past, and I want to say even last year, where they've had Right, right, now is the, uh, right now are the dog days of the season. You have January, you have February. The mid, middle of January to middle of February, that's when things get hard. Guys get sore. Guys get tired of being around each other a little bit. But now they've got three days just to go home and play Xbox, relax, or quarantined. Last season you saw the emotional, I'm not going to say breakdown, but the emotional fatigue after Clemson was able to beat Florida State at home, Duke at home. And then what happened, Faxon? They go up to Virginia Tech. They put on a lackluster performance because, quite frankly, they looked very tired last season. I think you're going to be able to avoid that this year. If there's a time to get this COVID situation going, <laughs> this is a good one because you're still playing well. You still have good feelings about your team. And Amir Sims tweeted out the other day, uh, I'm so excited to get ready to practice. When's the last time you've heard of an ACC player in the middle of January that's so excited to get back to his team to practice? That's a little bit of a result of COVID. I know I'm a glass half full guy, but I think that has a lot to do with it. And also, prop, might be getting Hunter Tyson back. We've seen from the Clemson basketball account tweeted that he is practicing today with his, uh, his custom mask. We do not have any more questions, but I will end the show with some news that uh, South Carolina head coach Frank Martin and assistant coach Chuck Martin have tested positive for COVID-19. Well, they are out for Saturday's game against LSU due to the health and safety protocols. I think there's positive tests within South Carolina, some contact tracing issues. Wow. Well, Frank Martin already had it. Yeah. That's but, the reason he lost his hair because of it. Like, yes, was, but he is apparently a contact trace or something along those lines, and he cannot coach and neither can the assistant. Who are they playing? Do you know? They play LSU on Saturday. Well, that's a tough one. And LSU just hung like 100 on Arkansas Did like they? two days ago. Yeah. That's a tough game. That's a tough game. Now, uh, Frank Martin, uh, he, t he coaches his guys tough. But he's a good dude, and I, I obviously wish him nothing but the best. He, he's a quality person. And uh, for the most part, uh, there aren't a whole lot of negative things said about him as a person. So uh, hopefully he gets better. But hopefully you enjoyed this episode. It was a little bit longer than it usually was. Beyond 22 Basketball did our whole scouting report, did a little good, bad, a little bit of everything today. So hope you enjoyed it and excited for the Tigers to get back on the court this Saturday against Virginia. If you need to come back and watch it, started with about 15, 20 minutes left. You can get your scouting report going right before the game starts. I'm Terrence Ogles.